you know, we're shortlisted to take part in the competition for the extension of the museum in Basel, right? And I finished second. From then on, the telephone rings. Yeah. That's what it is, right? Because so, you basically have, you know, uh, the competition was great, and then we finished second, and then they wanted us to teach. So I received the first phone call by DETH. DETH DET asking us to actually give a lecture. And then, you know, we give a lecture, and then they invited us to actually teach there. So anyway, and then Lausanne called us and said, we'd like you to teach. I said, you know, fine, you know, perhaps it's interesting. I had no experience whatsoever in teaching. It was not really my thing. And I was really a bit nervous, not so much about, you know, fulfilling the expectations. I don't think anyone had any expectations whatsoever, but really how, what kind of a strategy or methodology would I use in order to sort of bypass the tiresome clumsiness of architectural students, and I'm including myself as a, you know, it's just, a, it has nothing to do with a uh, condescending position or anything like that, but how could I bring forward a certain idea about architecture, not about our architecture, you know, so not to be followed at all, that was one of the aspects that I really didn't want to do, so I didn't want to have sort of a mimicking of, uh, because that's really what happens also when, within teaching architecture. You have a professor, which is sort of a tutelary figure, and then students tend to approach the project by the means of the professor following it. It's, it's sort of a kind of a inbreed relationship where one is confirmed by the other. And then so I, I wanted to stand out of this. So I wanted you know people to find their own way. Uh, teaching would not be a, a promotional tool for the office. But the question is, you know, these are intense. But well, how do you do that? You know? One aspect that I remember was uh, really uh, important to me is that I wanted them to start working on objects that were already great objects or great situations. Prior to any problematics about politics or anything like that, is that how can you kind of bring the students onto another level by bypassing the clumsiness, the first step, the ignorance, you know, the non so Basically, you, you hand in something, you, you ask people to start looking at things that already exist, you ask them why are they good, why, you know, why is it enjoyable, why, so open horizons, basically, without having, so putting myself also, the teacher within a, a more fragile position, not knowing everything about the topic, knowing quite a bit about it and having an intent and methodology, but the students being also left without the usual tools. And then the second point I wanted to deal is not just to speak about architecture. I just wanted to use architecture to speak about problematics that were greater than architecture, knowing that architecture played no role in solving those issues. That's really important. It was not about tackling an issue and then this is going to be solved by the means, by means of architecture. I don't think architecture, architecture can do much about that. But, you know, having the ability to young citizens to exchange through the filter of architecture about topics which were, I think, concerning. So we started with uh, the easiest one, I think, because let's say the first iteration of, uh, at the EPFL, you had already all the topics. But they were second year students, so you know, they had one year of studies. It was really difficult to actually bring them, so I had to pamper them a lot. No assistant, they came to the office, we, had, you know, we, we designed together basically. Then came uh, Zurich, and, and, and then there I thought, you know, that's the time to really introduce a sort of a general topic, which would you know, blend over, you know, spill over the notion of architecture, and that's the first project, airport and prison. Because I was struck by how much a prison, you know, as a facility, and the airport have so much in common. And there was a time in the field of architecture where, you know, architects would be the experts about what a prison should be. All these projects of, you know, facilities, of uh, confinement facilities. It was also pointed out to by, by uh, Michel Foucault of the Heterotopias, you know, and then the sovereign states going to the security states, moving again to the control state and so on and so on. All these things were really interesting. And then I realized that actually an airport has a lot of features which actually resemble prison, although they're not prisons. An airport is not a prison. But you know, don't, there is no homology between the two, except that they share certain things. The first project, the first iteration of the semester was the easiest one because it was a typomorphological one. So you know that there are canopies, you know that there are corridors, you know that there are you know, membranes, you know that there are cells, you know that there are repetitive structures, you know that there's security, there are prosthetic elements, some deal with security, some deal with performance and so on. They all share that, you know, the two, the two worlds really all share that. There were so many architectural elements that were common to the both typology that I thought would be interesting to investigate that and therefore I proposed the students to actually choose a prison, choose their prosthetics, choose their architecture in order to develop an airport based on the 
previous design of, uh, on an analysis of an existing prism, right? So they chose different prisms you know, according to their intents and so on, and they start to build. That allow us to really build up slowly a sort of a understanding about problems that we were confronted by uh, in a daily business, let me say. And also use great architecture, great statements with architecture. So, and the whole idea was, okay, how do you bypass this clumsiness? If I asked a second year student or third year student to design an airport, I wouldn't even be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, it's a time where building an airport, you know, you don't need the expertise of the architects because there are so many expertises, you know, there's the Schengen, 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 not Schengen, so it's, it's security things. And basically, you are kind of a decorator, right, in the field. So how could you naively reconquer for a time in an academy the authority that the architect had when he was designing prison confinement spaces in the 19th, 18th century? So that was the idea, all right, knowing that we wouldn't build really. From then on, I realized that it was a, a potent strategy because people could engage with that. They were excited because they would not just speak about the discipline, they would speak about the world that surrounded them. Through the discipline, they would be able somehow to paint, and that's the idea of portraits. So you are literally painting by means of architecture issues that have been raised within society and so on. So it's not about, you know, doing the airport or the ultimate airport. It's always about a multiplicity, it was about what? An airport, right? A singularity. And then of course it was about defining other topics. Then I realized there was also very much in common between finance or economy and, 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 and religion. The first transaction when it comes to economy, uh, I'm not talking about capitalism as such, for a long time Entograph thought that the first exchange took place as a barter system. Nietzsche was the first one, before any ethnologist, really, that pointed out to the fact that it was not true. They were exchanging blocks of debt. They were not exchanging objects, they were exchanging debts. So someone would actually get something, and then there was a debt. And it goes on and on. Uh, you've got the Basilica, which is a commercial space, at first, before it's then recycled by uh, Christianity. There's a whole series then when the stock market emerged in the second half of the 20th, uh, 19th century, um, the agents, we're not certain that people would cope with that idea of the market becoming, you know, kind of sort of a, a gauge to how economy would work and so on. So they knowingly borrowed religious architecture to promote a certain idea, to build up a sort of a trust, you know, kind of a face of what the market would be through the use of temple-like architectures and so on and so on. So there was a lot of things in common in a certain way. And it was a beautiful topic because it also, you know, it came just after the 2008 subprime crisis. It was really a hot topic in a certain way. It was not opportunistic because we had that topic prior to the crisis, but we then we reiterated the thing. And, uh, and the, the, the students really responded really well. It was really exciting also about that. But all in all, if I want to make it short, it was the idea is, you know, it was not so noble in a sense. How can I avoid having to correct everyone, act as a tutelary figure, and I know when you don't? We're going to be discovering something. I'm going to be your guide, but I'm going to be climbing with you. What was the precise tool that students were offered in order to tackle this clumsiness? References, or sources, but also a lot of texts, a lot mm -hmm. of reading, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of freedom also, because they were not, you know, the, the format was given, but it was just the format. The content was really there, their intent. It was also black and white, you know, it, it, was, a, it, it was mandatory to be black and white, except for the li architecture, literally, because we couldn't do it without the color. If you speak about life, you need the color. So we they wanted to have the color. Novels need to be in color. Kind of a bit black and white, but there were there, there were images mourning for something, right? And what did students have to produce? They had to produce a scenario, an argument, a building, images, no model. And they were also allowed to use different techniques: uh, movies, text, writings, you know, political statements, and so on. So it was about searching and telling them that because. As a student, I had always experienced history as a kind of a sententious, linear way of things. These are the way things happen. But for me as a designer, or for us as designers, if you want to deal with history, it has to become something alive. It cannot just be something that was there and that's the way it happened. You have to know a certain amount of facts for sure. But then based on this, history can become for a designer potential. You can reactivate certain things without nostalgia. It's not that I wished that an airport would look like a pyramid. Not at all. It's not about this. Right? But it's about you know, composing with elementary features, reorganizing them in order to state something else. And I thought it was a kind of a, you know, kind of a magic tool. It became later on, and that's why we quit after six years, it became sort of a, st students started to actually understand it to a point where it becomes sort of a recipe. And once it becomes a recipe, that's when you have to stop. So after six iterations you know, uh, uh, of the semester, we said, okay, they wanted us to continue, 
And we said, no, we're stopping because we want to re-question that methodology. And it was also the idea to actually confront uh, cinema, the history of art, the history of literature, political philosophy, notions of concepts, you know, use and abuse about the notion of concepts in the history of architecture. No one uses the word idea, for example. And I like what Gilles Deleuze says about concept should be just attributed to philosophy. So it's a new way, it's another way to think, basically. But in architecture, there's no such thing. I mean, why don't people use simply the word idea? You know? So concept sounds much more fancy. And uh, I remember Deleuze you know, saying in his interviews, so with such a wit and such a sense of humor, saying, well, you know, we have the concept, each time has the concept to deserve, and now it's spaghetti factories selling uh, food, and they have concepts in marketing, they have concepts everywhere. So I say we'd exclude that notion, and whenever a student would come, oh, my concept, I said, no, forget about it. There's no concept to it. It's just an idea. I mean, if anything, it might be an idea, right? So at the disposal, there was, a, there was the, this, uh, so they had to search a lot, not necessarily to research, but to search. They were not able, you know, to make a research is something else, I think, but they had to search a lot. And at the time, in 2010, was beginning with the internet, the databases were not what they are nowadays. So Adam Caruso, for example, who was teaching in the same framework as we did, uh, he once told the students, his students of his studio said, if a book is missing in the library, it's got to be at Mayday. And that was true. There were just piles of books everywhere. And people got frustrated a little because nothing was actually shown. So we would never hang stuff, you know, intermediate reviews, were, you know, we would never show what we're doing. It was just a big bang on the end. We hoped it would be a big bang, but we would never show. We kept it kind of secretive, you know. It was not an intent, but we thought, why do we need to have all these sketches and so on? And bring your references, then read the books, and then at the end we'll see what the output outcome is. Yeah. Well, there is though a difference between visual references and written no. references. Mm -hmm. And, well, when I was in school, I was totally against visual references. Because, you know, when you look at an image, that image is printed in your head. Instead, when you read something, each of us interprets those words in a different way. If you talk, you're talking about a corridor, and you, it, the words and you're describing a corridor, and you get an image of that corridor, and you get an image, and he gets an image. We all get different images of those corridors. Still the same reference, written reference, but mm -hmm. the visuals are very different. But if you show a corridor, and you say, this is a corridor, but, but, but if I may, <laughs> I understand very much your, your, your point of view, but, but I would kind of differentiate between an image and what an illustration is. You're talking about the illustration. The illustration is, of course, you know, there's a caption, this is the Galera degli Uffizi, and then that's what I do. This is, I think an image, just like a text, can be read different ways. And that's what qualifies it as an image and not as an illustration. Mm -hmm. Don't think, you know, any one would dare to say that an artist is painting an illustration. When he's doing a portrait, he's not doing an illustration of it. He's seizing certain aspects and characteristics and then kind of, you know, twist it to its own intent. And it can be read from all sides. But at the same time, you have to explain this to today's students because yep. they're used to looking at so many images that they don't read the image because yep. they're looking yep. at it. Yep. They're not reading yep. it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Illustrations, yes. And not yeah. as the main element that yeah. you need to read. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, I think it's an incredible point to make today, yeah. especially for the liberation of images. But I have to say that a lot of people, I mean certain people, got also nervous about the handling of these images because they thought they were partly cryptic. And this, 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 this encryption was also part of the intent, you know. It's, it's yeah. just, People are kind of, kind of shaken, you know, I know that reference, it looks kind of, but why? How come you use it that way? You know, it's kind of, so it turned out for some people to be sort of a bubble bath that the thing was to some, you know, at times really pleasant, at times irritating and so on, because there was no loyalty to the historical fact. It's not about the post-truth at all, what we're experiencing nowadays, but it was the ability to use a reference and to have it state something else say something additional, additional to, to what the original content is. And it, it was about the production of images also, but not the illustration. So there was always a discrepancy between what was shown as an image and what the plans were. 
that's still something that is at stake when we teach at Voluptas nowadays at the ETH is that I engage, I, we tend to engage with the students and say, well, because they're, they're stuck into this scheme, right? Nowadays, they, we all use the kind of same tools. So you design something, then you render it, and then you see what the object is. The sheer fact is that you're turning architecture not into a prop, uh, process, but into a product. And once you turn architecture into a product, and you give that to a client, that's the only thing that is gonna be changed. So it's an impoverishment of the process, it's a bypassing of the process, and it's not leaving you any freedom in attempting, and you're chasing a product. Uh, so that's really dangerous. I mean, the smartest clients would not deal with it that way, mm -hmm. of course, but the majority of clients would deal that way. So I think by not showing the project, by not showing really what it looks like, because this is not the point to do, which is the beginning of a design, and allowing for this liberty and this freedom to then gain traction later on within the project by not providing them with an object. But of course it's difficult to swallow. If you buy a car, you can go to the shop, try it, buy it, or refuse to buy it because you don't like it and so on. Architecture is a bit different, right? I mean, there's an abstract notation. You can't just build it and say, well, I don't like it. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> Some are way too big. You know, it's too slow. It's too this. So you have to find a way to, I can, you know, strategically kind of keep that intent kind of blurred and I always thought, you know, the pe I think I have a kind of a nice analogy with me. Usually people tend to say, well, I think when you do a rendering, you stand at the perfect distance of the object and you see what it's going to look like, no matter how you know, mysterious the light is, or no matter how fake it appears and so on. I propose to, we propose within Portrait to stand really close to the image. And only by walking back then comes the image to up. So you're seeing certain things really close in a certain way, and then you are backing up. And then, later on, you'll see the full picture. But it's not about seeing the full picture. So they're reductive, they are lacunary in a certain way, and they're discrepant to the drawings themselves. But it's an additional information. I don't think, as a teacher, we need to see what it looks like as such. No, but your, your point with that was to, to aim at a accurate partiality, you know? Yep. That, that was always the, the thing. You Unexact. Know, the, 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 the real word is really, one of the core texts of the, of the book is, is this book by uh, Gilles Deleuze and Félix Gattari in Mille Plateaux called Treaties on Nomadology. And within this Treaties on Nomadology, he refers to the proto-geometries of Husserl. And Husserl speaks about this, you know, there's imperial essences, royal essences, like a circle, a triangle, you know. Then there's all the rest. Something that looks like a triangle, but is not exactly a triangle, that mathematics cannot define as such, resembles something, but is not. It's not that they are wrong, it's that they are inexact in the sense that they are rigorously inexact. And it's about, a, you know, gaining that rigorous inexactitude that was at the core of the design, I think. Mm -hmm. So you can be inexact, we'll accept that, but it has to be rigorously built. And that at different levels, in terms of drawings, in terms of images, and in terms of argument. That's one thing we always constantly insisted is how you present your project, how you define your project, right? Coming back a bit to the object. Yeah. So there's this, what you just said now. So there's the argument. Yeah. Then you have the drawings. Yeah. And then you have the images. Yeah. And these were displayed in a quite uh, sec, quite... Uh, yeah, very drawing. strict, formal, you know, all the images were at the top, uh, all the drawings were at the bottom. Every student had to produce the same kind of thing because it was not about, again, it was not about the definite article. It was not about the absolute airport. It was just an airport or a project within the field of finance and religion. Within the, so it's about multiplicity. And in order to actually gain traction within multiplicity or actually to make it really sensible, I think you need to have a homogeneous layout. You cannot let the people actually do what they want. I think there is differences that you have to point out to, to a rigid framework. That's, that, that was our stance, I'm not saying this is the only stance. But it was important that you wouldn't be able, you know, that everyone would use the same kind of tools at their disposal, which was framed, and then, you know, propose differentiation. You differentiate. Yes. One project. Yeah. So you have, the student has to sell a story. Yep. With words. Yep. Present. Yep. Perform. Yep. Perform? Sometimes there was performance. <laughs> sometimes it was not. Sometimes it was. Some no, I'm asking you this because you know we produce small exhibitions, yeah. and you know sometimes people come to a white box and they don't want you to talk to them. They just want to look, and it's like no talking. And so you know they don't want to talk to a plan, and then they look at the images, and then they look at the box, and it's like that's it. I mean, I'm okay with this. But then if you tell the story, mm -hmm. if you perform, 
the exhibition, then they gain a completely different narrative. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they gain the context and why we took these photos and how many photos and why is relevant today and why is not. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm starting to believe that the personality matters. The person mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. telling the story mm -hmm. yeah. is the only thing that matters. Yeah. Yeah. So people choose your project or your project because they like you and they don't like you or whatever. You know, you look nicer that day, or you perform better. Uh, yes, that's. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I tend to agree with you uh, at that level. <laughs> but but I think choosing an architect, or you know, choosing uh, is choosing an architect also, choosing someone yes. you can actually work with, right? Yes. But of course, this is really influenced by a lot of, you know, I don't have to mention that, you know, kind of maneuvers in the back and so on. Well, it's, <laughs> it's a it's a lot of charm, you know, you're kind of playing a kind of a game. Of, <laughs> Uh, it's fine. I'm also playing it. I'm just saying this is this this is part of the part of the game, right? But there are count examples of great architects who couldn't give a speech. I think Jim Sterling was a, one of them, right? Yeah. He could hardly really defend this project. He said, "Don't bury an architect. Know that about this." The opposite is, of course, obviously true, right? People who can actually engage into kind of a performance and then playing with that's that's what irritates me a little bit. You know, they said that you have to do to you have to become charming. You have to. Uh, but to really talk about the architecture happens seldomly also. Mm. Yeah. It's also something, for example, the students were never described in the project that this is the way I enter and this is the way I exit mm -hmm. and this is the way I experience the thing. This, I'm really allergic to that kind of phenomenological, you know, strictly phenomenological expression of what architecture is. I'd rather have them, you know, what does it trigger? What kind of, what are the echoes of your project? With what does it resonate? within history. That I find really interesting because that's also because a, a personal affinity. I'm not saying this is the only way to deal with architecture. Not at all. I mean, there's no exclusive methodology to produce architecture. But I think it, we were mostly interested in seeing how a certain stance would echo a problematic within history. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, as Nietzsche pointed out to this linear time and problematics kind of bounce off at different rhythms, right? One of the questions that I No. can be part of culture, more of a, at large, mm -hmm. you know? When you enter architecture school, you are taught to do something to produce an object, but sometimes you don't feel connected to the cultural world you're in. Mm -hmm. Maybe because you don't have the intellectual tools yet, you haven't read enough books, and you haven't, you're not, looking at the exhibitions, or you're not part of culture. What is culture, and yeah, how architecture and culture just enter into a dialogue? It's difficult because I think we would have to define what culture is, right? Let's say, if I were to, if I were to state what I'm interested in about culture, it's not this sedimentation of history and then becomes authoritative in a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. So that's not necessarily about that. I would rather think that culture is also being produced as it is being designed, more than, okay, you are now part of culture, and then I'm gonna do, you know, you know what I mean? So I think it's, a, it's an active process, culture, more than just something that is there, and then it's been, uh, you know, okay, it's accepted. Michelangelo is great, I'm part of culture, <laughs> fine. But that doesn't bring us forward. So it's, it's this work in progress of building up sort of culture. It's also about certain criticality. Huh? So I think that the students were engaged, I don't know, that some of you took part to the semesters. It's about just simply not accepting everything as it is, right? So a certain criticality, so it's building up an argument in order to become, it's not about saying it's good or bad. Criticality is the beginning of articulation in a certain way. So how do you articulate the different things together? So transitions are extremely important. Does it make sense? Does really, as a painter would work, literally, you know, how much red compared to yellow and so on in order to make it really a, a striking effect. That's, that's what I think. So culture as a constantly producing, you know, kind of a factory like feature, that yes, but nothing about culture as archive. It's not an archive. It couldn't be read as an archive. People, if people were tempted to actually you know, read this as an archive, it wouldn't work. You know, it was full, full of you know, distortions in history because it's serving another purpose. You know, it's about, about the production, perhaps, of a certain culture in the process of designing. Yeah, it's not stable, right? Not at all. It's very, very unstable. I think it's, it's also very well illustrated. I don't know how much you remember from your project. Again, if we come to this, to this part of the book, 
you see that many references are repeated in different projects. So yeah. there's not one thing that says this is this and this is not anything else. Rather, this is this, but it could be many other things. So the, the book really works like this. And I think it's something you also took now to the look just now. So yeah, but the other thing I think the book is, is more than, that's what I was also saying, it's not an archival uh, project. It's also, it took place, you know, we, we attempted several times to make this book uh, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people told us, it's not going to be possible. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> <You're> just, <laughs> it's an impossible task. Mm -hmm. You're going to pay copyright. It's going to be horrible. But then we were stubborn, you know, <laughs> stubborn enough to attempt to do that. And we managed to do it. But it took us 10 years, huh? so it takes a lot of time. But this book is not just a collection of what the projects were, they're rearranged. So there's a criticality also. It's a look back on what the work that was done. I'm saying this because it's completely augmented. Uh, so there's a selection, not all sources are there, not all projects are there. It's augmented by introductory texts that were not there. It's augmented by descriptive texts that they were not there. It's augmented by glossary that was partly there but was augmented. So it, you, know, you, you put that on table and then you start augmenting the book in a certain way to the point where it becomes really uh, this object which in itself is not just a series of semesters but has attained, I hope, a certain autonomy. So it's an independent motive, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. It's definitely affecting, for me, I don't see any opposition between theory and practice, or practice, for example. I think as an architect, you're a theorist as much as you're a practitioner, and that through the notation, the notation which is plan sections and you know, adequate representations, scale representations. So I think you're both at the same time, you're a theorist as much as you're a practitioner. Huh? Uh, and I, I, never see, I, I, I never thought that there is like the theoretical part and then the practice is going to be completely different. There are things that we approach projects in a similar way, although we don't create scenarios with references and so there's also is kind of a, of course there's a search and there's a research you know, and kind of ruminate basically those kind of things and you, then you build up something about this but 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 yes this is but it's not a strategy to become a prominent builder within the field of architecture there are much easier way to do that you know so it's it's a detour but it's a detour into which you come back with a backpack which I think is loaded uh, with certain expectations, envies, curiosities, and so on. But you never leave the field of architecture. That was something that I always insisted on to all the students. They shouldn't leave the field of architecture. They were asked to leave the field of architecture because they're going to be talking about religion and economy, they're going to be talking about prisons, societal controls, and so on and so on. Things that have to do with architecture to a certain things, but very little, right? Um, but they were leaving the field of architecture being an architect, not becoming or pretending to become a sociologist, an anthropologist, or a philosopher philosopher or musician or filmmaker. So you leave the field of architecture knowingly remaining an architect, not attempting to become a sociologist and give us lessons about sociology or anthropology. You are going to be using anthropology through the field of architecture in order to produce architecture. So you always remain an agent of architecture. If you look at what architecture has become, this fetishism for the object and for the, you know, the figure of the architect, I was telling, you know, we were on the train, we had time to actually chat also. I'm not that old, but I'm older than these young people here, right? So I, when I studied, there was never a magazine like Vogue talking about architecture. I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong that they speak about it, but it became a sort of a time where all of a sudden architecture became cool. Architecture was an expertise when it was studied. Nowadays, it's become something of a trend, of fashionable. Everyone talks about it, everyone does it, everyone, you know, everyone has an opinion about it. It was not the case before. Or let's say to a lesser extent, I would say. And it was also a little bit about that. It was, I said, you guys, you know, before you become independent, before you can actually develop your own architecture, before you are actually confident enough, it takes a lifetime to become a good architect, I really think. And this is not positive or negative. I really think there are many professions like that. But, but I think it takes a real lifetime to become a really a good architect. But it's, it's worth the detour. It's worth the detour and worth to bypass this idea of the iconic or of uh, the cult of the fetishist yeah, and of the so architect. It was domineering. It, it slowly became domineering. You know, I don't want to give names or so on because we're all part of it. We're all part of it. We all share responsibility for that to a certain extent, but it, it's convenient. But all of a sudden, you know, it becomes fashionable and people tend to, you know, you gain traction, the attention, then that's what happens in any field, I think. This hype will go away, for sure. I don't know, it might take 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, it might be dead, it doesn't matter, but this time will come, for sure. <laughs> uh, where uh, 
the architect is not so central and can be again considered as a facilitator and nothing else than a facilitator. Yep, a great one, uh, a great architecture being produced, but he stands really between the expectation of someone and, and, and the corpus of the city, and he's really an, a facilitator. Yeah, but you are also producing objects of fetishism. I mean, you know, there's the object itself, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you are actually aiming at, you know, gaining a sort of a fetishist view of what the object yeah, is. Yeah, I know, and it's just so easy to detach this yeah. from the content. You sell books, you know. I can buy this book and not open it and be, see, let it sit and then sell it again. Yeah, it's also an object, so, of course. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so. it's an object. No, but it's the promotion of the object, which is a bit annoying, you know, that the object becomes kind of a, you know, something that you can, you can fetishize about. Mm. It, and that's fine. We all kind of do that, right? But if, if you promote that only view, that's something that's irritating, right? So, for example, if you build, you know, build, for example, Rem, I think, did uh, quite a bit of harm, but it was necessary to do that. You know, I think it was necessary to do that. He didn't do harm. It was necessary to do that. But when he said, fuck context, it was a real specific time. It was the idea of this tabula rasa and then this thing. thing. Everyone knows, Ren knows that for a fact, that, that nothing happens without a context. And that context is not necessarily just built substances. It's also yeah, yeah, political yeah. context and so of on. Course. So I thought it was also a time to say, well, no, context exists, right? And that context is that of, okay, the society of control or that context of violence and religion or, you know, all these kind of things. They're, they're part of the context. And then there's the city. I'm in love with the city more than I'm in love with the object. I know I can't resist an object, but I'm more in love with the city than the object itself. And uh, for example, when we applied at, 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 at the ETH, we didn't show a single project by Maybe, not a single one. And I stated at the very beginning of the lecture, I said, listen, we're not here to promote our own work. We're here to promote a teaching assignment, a framework that we're going to develop within the coming years. It's not about us. It's not about our architecture, but what we're going to be doing within this, this school, right? So, I think we were very few that actually, you know, uh, kind of took that strategy. I was like, not showing. And I was showing images of anonymous architecture that created absolutely fantastic urban environments, right? You know, all these kind of, just this incredible piece of architecture. All from Italy, all from Italy. Yeah. <laughs> often from Italy. And unable to point out to any name or any feature, any object taken separately is without any interest, brought together. That it comes. Mm -hmm. This absolutely wonderful environment. For me, it's always kind of shocking to visit Germany, for example. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was flat and round, yeah. so you see the architects. Yeah. You don't see the certification or the contracts yeah. and yeah. all yeah. the messiness of the urban environment. Yeah. And so we really see that it's without that, the result is super poor, even if you're a great architect. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you put the, I don't know, the Pantheon. Yeah. In Berlin, it's no, not the same no, thing as the Pantheon no. in Rome. Yeah. Perhaps we should ask ourselves why the 20th century has not been able to really build up, except a few exceptions, but has not really been able, or let's say modernism has not been able to actually produce a really convincing city also. Yeah. So whenever it was really implemented on a large scale, it turned out to be really kind of deceptive, right? Artistic in many aspects of it. But maybe that's because it was proposed in the model. No. Mm -hmm. So you can take one book a day for the rest of your life and you will always have a new book and mm -hmm. a new point of view. Mm -hmm. But when you have principles mm -hmm. and try to build a model, then you have a repetition of that mm -hmm. model everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the main problem with yeah. the five points of architecture or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's kind of it's like how can you do architecture with five points? No, no, it's true. I completely share your point of view, but, but, but of course it would be also unfair to limit, to limit modernism to that, right? Let's say there were, yeah, the, the shift was massive, it was not only in the field of architecture, you have to see how it happens historically speaking, you have to replace also, that's why history is so important also to understand, you know, where the bourgeoisie stood in France at the time, 19th century, what took place with the First World War, then the emergence of not just a new language within the field of architecture, but also within music, within literature. The beginning of the modernism is really a thrilling time, but also a very tragic time, you know, very tragic. And it's driven by those forces, right? So they see that through that tragedy, they see as much opportunity as they see problematic features. And then there's the advancement technological. You know, progress, for example, is a notion that I don't understand in the field of architecture. I don't see no progress, literally no progress, between the Domus and the House of Bordeaux uh, by Orient.
both are absolutely wonderful pieces of architecture, but it would be hard for me to say what is the progress within that. You know, there's technological progress through quantification of certain data, and even that is questionable, you know. Uh, well, progress is connected to goals, so you cannot define progress without establishing the goals towards the progress, and it's always a vector vectorial movement. Yeah, but, but you then cannot you say can... there's that modernism, the no, but I'm just postmodernism is the progress. No, no, of course uh, not. No, 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 so no, that's not no, the no. point. But you can say a window isolates better than the other because you have the quantification, you have the number, and say, well, then, you yeah, know. You establish uh, which goals you, are going you to You establish through the product, exactly. okay, that's an yeah. improvement. Yeah. Is it an improvement of architecture? I don't know. But it's definitely an improvement if you actually, you know, categorize the parameters that you actually want to aim at. Mm -hmm. But progress in architecture means really little or nothing. Yeah, if I mean, we're staying goals, in a hotel, yeah. which is you know kind of a low-key hotel, not 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 not, not a, you know a decent hotel. But I mean, you know, in this you have sixteen high ceilings because you're in Italy, and everything is being chopped up. So into you know, you just have the room for the bed, and then you stand up in this vertical space and you think, well, what went on there? <laughs> <laughs> and it's obvious what went on, right? The more rooms, the more money. That's just the way it is, right? <laughs> it's so simple, right? And and. And then when, 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 when you kind of question this, when you kind of question this, yeah, but it's because, it's, yeah, I know. Yeah, but why would you, you know, there's a ponderation between what you could do and what you should do. In our, I don't know, this is kind of uh, irritating, you know. The economy has taken over and has divided everything. It's just, it's just disproportionate, right? It's just, you think if you're an agent of the architecture, you, you understand what has been done. But the reasons are so dirty and so obvious that you think, wait, where, where, where's the limit, literally? So what, what, what do you think that allows this to, to prevent? Let, let's try to pivot again to teaching and the book. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we're drifting. But that's good. No, no, it's great. But I, I think that your approach back then, again, I was not working with you then. I was just kind of responsible, co-responsible for this, is that when you go through this method, you would be aware that there is more than economics when you are an agent of architecture. So no. you, by tapping into what you described for as culture, Hopefully, the architects are coming out of politics, I don't know what you have to say. Uh, you would be aware that there is more to it than addressing these immediacy issues, no? But I insist on one thing, and that's, you know, it was not the goal to avoid these kind of things, right? So yeah. I was not, oh, let's produce students who will not do that. There was nothing there, but this is kind of an anecdotal view. Yeah, things. of course, of course, of course. In other words, I'd rather have two, two human beings exchanging about uh, what is great about the Pantheon, than being this figure telling them this is how it was, <laughs> right? No, this is how it is. Oh, this is how it is. Or, you know, that is something I never, uh, or, I, you know, I hope I never tend to do with the students. When we talk about architecture mm. with a capital A, there is lots of expectation. Mm. Did you do it? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I saw the point. Mm. Yeah. I understood the yeah. point. Like yeah. in architecture, there's expectation. Mm. And you're supposed to design a comfortable room with a nice fireplace yeah. so you can feel good. And yeah, but uh, the, uh, no, you know, you're talking about the difference between Homo sapiens and Homo faber. Yeah. I have the feeling that you know, the students also came to our studio knowingly that they would not just be homo faber, which is what is phrased nowadays, you make the things, right? About, but it, you know, to think about the thing is not valued as such, right? Yeah. So homo sapiens is nowadays kind of a, you know, kept in the shadow of homo faber yeah. because, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. and uh, I thought it was a great opportunity for students to think differently and to become homo sapiens instead of homo faber. So homo your or partly. Well, uh, it would be okay. overwhelmingly ambitious to say that. I mean, it's also about making, of course, but, but yeah, it's not about necessarily design, about, but yeah, it's it's design, design, but it's critical, but it's not, you know. 
putting the uh, flat iron building upside down and uh, you know <laughs> adding on top uh, a, a Soviet aircraft carrier is not about the reality of that object, but really what it can do through the image, and, you know, uh, and uh, not just the gesture, but also the way you accommodate the program. There is, there is a certain truth that nowadays what is actually valued is Homo faber and not Homo sapiens. And, maybe, and the, the other thing is that because Homo sapiens is about acquisition of a certain knowledge, I'm looking at all of you and all of us also within this room, a lot of people would say, I, I think I'm facing students who know things. Because the structure of the media nowadays and, and of the world allows you to know things. But there's a difference between knowing something and having acquired that knowledge. And I believe that only by acquiring a knowledge you are able to navigate the world. Knowing a data has never made you a better man. But acquiring a knowledge, the process of acquiring a knowledge, that's what allows you to become critical and navigate the world. Yeah, when Just to know. Yeah, I can ask anyone a very difficult question. You, you know, they all ask ChatGPT, they'll have the answer, right? <laughs> but, but no, but look, that's a real problem also. You know that ChatGPT has an answer for everything. Now, it does have an answer for everything. The other day there was a study that was made is that a guy asked ChatGPT, how many stones should I eat in order to be healthy? ChatGPT answered one. It did not have enough referential data to say you shouldn't eat stones. So he took the lowest denominator and said, well, one is enough. So knowledge as such is very difficult to acquire, but you have the knowledge. So now I'm facing with students who actually can give me all the answers, but don't know how to, you know, they, they have not done the process. They all have an opinion, we all have an opinion, but they have not forged an opinion. Yeah, but even this acquiring, as we have to say, that goes beyond. It's you. You acquire and then it, you turn it into operated. So if it, if it's, yep. you cannot operate it, then it's the same. You can have it, but it doesn't yeah, yeah, but but, but but still, uh, I think the acquisition. It's like the, it's really the analogy and the metaphor of the, you know forging an opinion, as we say in French, it's a forger an opinion, mm -hmm. ou avoir une opinion. Everyone has an opinion. The difference between someone who has forged an opinion, he knows what he's talking about, mm -hmm. or having an opinion, everyone everyone has, right? Sometimes when you look at universities, you can see that there are great courses, but there is very little uh, exchange between the professors. Mm -hmm. And so you can recognize very well each direction, but again, the culture of the yeah. school yeah. Yeah. is somehow not very interesting because there is no dialogue between the that I'm experiencing, I'm experiencing that on a weekly basis with the school we are, and we are tempted, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm part of the problem also, but I could be part of the solution, but we are tempted to exchange with people. But people tend to be very defensive about yeah. it. Uh, um, uh, but it's true that there is no culture of what the 18th century would call the dispute, right? so the debating. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was not negative in the 18th century, the dispute is, uh, you know, debat in French means to discuss through an argument in order not to fight, to prevent to fight. the fight. That's what it means, to debat. That does not happen anymore. And why do you think is that? Because oh. it's seen as opposition. Yeah. I don't know, you have perhaps an answer or you have an, an opinion. I don't know why it doesn't take place. You think this is the only thing? But I mean, a university is a great platform, no? Yeah, it but uh, it should be, it should be. But maybe there is no platform uh, in the sense that people don't come together anymore. Yeah, but maybe it doesn't, doesn't have to be immediate. And for no. instance, if, if you refer back to this, it was very clear the impact that the portrait series had at the ETH at the time when it came to image production. Yeah. So you could still feel the echoes of that eight years afterwards. So when we joined now yeah, as Revolta, yeah. it was still being seen as the, the chair that was taking image production to another level, not in terms of like, it being necessarily better, but at least in the meaning of the, so what does it mean to produce an image? And that, when we arrived, it was still there, and then it was taken up on, and now then, for a while, it was with the movie. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a lecturer or professors taking positions and then saying, like having this debate, but debate, the debate can happen through media production, through the topics that are approached, through the choices of... Uh, yeah, but you realize also that it's become more and more difficult. For example, even through, you know, the format, for example, final reviews at the ETH, when I was a student, everything would take place into public space. Yeah, of yes. course, of course, of course. 
And it was amazing because you would have a review, you know, people would, it, it was open, it was a public event, it was open to everyone, people yeah. would walk through, now you need a bloody map of the school knowing where it is, it's so confidential when you enter, you're disturbing the thing, there's, there's this sacrality which makes no sense, you know, mm -hmm. and I think it was much, much more casual, not less serious, but casual in a way that was really promoting also an ability to exchange immediately. But now you have to search. There's a gap between the time you go from that chair to the other chair. That's a little bit of a shame, I think. And it's true that it's become a little bit less, although it appears to be the opposite, that the environment of university with everything that is happening nowadays becomes sort of a cradle of politics, which I don't think it is. I think uh, it's slightly something different. But, but, but I don't want to engage into that discussion, but I would say, you know, previously there was really debate. For example, when I was a student at ETH, there was not the studios that were so important and relevant for what the essence of the, of the school was, but the two chairs of history. And the two chairs of history were confrontational. There was Werner Oxlade on one side and Kurt Foster. It's not that they were enemies at all, not at all. They were really good colleagues and, you know, you know respectful with one another. But there was really a dichotomy, a, a different view on history, a different take. And students accordingly had somehow to hover between <laughs> those two worlds. But, but, but the, the, the leaders of the school were not the design studios, as it had become later on, right, I would say. Um, it was historical chairs that were really central to a positioning. And that allowed for debates, I think, because then history was at the center of the concern and not the, you know, not the designers themselves, how cool they were and so on, but how they were dealing with history. I think part of it is like when you go to American academia uh, and you see students present and you, know, you have courses of how you should present and you, know, you have to put forward your argument and one wins and the other loses. <laughs> yep. And somehow European universities never had this, but now they're trying to get to the same level, so they, yep. they put these methods forward. And this is killing plurality somehow, mm -hmm. and your idea of arg arguments, argumentative, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because it's, yeah. it's not about duality. Should it be? No, it shouldn't be. No, it's not. It's also not about individuality. No. Yeah. So, but it's that's quite interesting what you said because actually it has been shown by many studies in the learning sciences that this kind of discussion that is called uh, a negative socio-cognitive conflict, it actually de-promotes knowledge production. Mm -hmm. And if uh, the, the credo of an institution is to promote knowledge, produce knowledge, as is the ETH, as is any uh, good university, no? then what you actually should promote is uh, epistemic socio-cognitive conflict. And that means that students with different uh, perspectives on one topic come together and collaboratively try to find out one solution or more solutions for this problem or to expand the edge of knowledge that is being looked upon. So, and I think, I would say, maybe you disagree, but at the ETH, I don't feel this American approach. And at least what we try to promote is pretty much that there's a research unit, that there's a studio focusing on knowledge, and everything that comes out of these discussions is to enhance this edge of knowledge. I believe that this is spreading out. I, at least I don't see this. this but and that I also, I mean, there, it was also the same. You have different books, different buildings. But it's it's several different. books. It's several books brought into one. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah, there's a labyrinthine navigation. No, but what you said before, so the first semester, airport prison. Mm -hmm. So it, there was this uh, typological approach mm -hmm. to this mm -hmm. by different groups of students. Always group work, by the way. So yep. always, always group banking work. on that. And it was to, when you would look at the sum of it, if you look at one project, it's, um, I don't know, maybe a stay lost. I, I wouldn't say that, but my understanding of it is that if you see one, you don't understand the richness of the whole. Yeah. But when you perceive the semester, what came out of it, it's mind and it's mind boggling. It's, it changed your perspective on both typologies, on the functioning society, on how you look to other typology because you saw that now. Mm -hmm. So that's, I would say, as a very good example of what mm -hmm. might, might mm -hmm. be the work mm -hmm. of a research mm -hmm. unit. But all in all, it was a wonderful experience. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't have to be a final well, word, I'm just saying. No. I guess it's the best school in Europe. No. Yeah. No, according to the ranking, it's not. Well, the ranking is something else. But 
Yeah, but the, 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 you see, you know, so you're a byproduct of your of your time. You, you look at quantifications and then. No, I'm against it, but I have to know yeah, it. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you, you have Delft, and then you have uh, in the Bartlett, and then is the ETA. I don't know what what they teach there. I just know that I, I just found it curious. I only see the printed out, of course, because I used to go to the ETH for the prints yep, because yep. they were open. So every yeah. semester I would go. They are still open, by the way. Yes. But you have to search your way. Yes. <laughs> uh, for me, the difference is quite clear. I, I, course, I haven't seen anything printed from Delft or uh, the If Barton. you had to choose today a school, if you were a student, it would be impossible to see it. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking and I've been at yeah. university for 20 years, so <laughs> it's, it's kind of No, we're very, sp we're very spoiled. There is no yeah. doubt about this. It's a, it's a great school. Mm -hmm. It's a great uh, location. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like this. <laughs> like this. <laughs> it's completely unreasonable. But another thing that is kind of interesting and at the same time unfair is that, you know, certain institutions work because they have very few students. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which are super privileged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's going to be a future fight, huh? For us. Because the school has grown. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, uh, and through the rankings and through the quantifications and so on. Don't point at me when you No, say no I'm just saying the one <laughs> that, that you refer to. I mean, you're, that you refer to. I mean, basically, it seems that there is no, there is no escape from growing and becoming more visible and so on. Yeah. I truly believe the opposite. I think if the ETA wants to keep um, quality, the quality, it's going to have to be reasonable with that. Mm -hmm. But already now is the issue huh? with. Already now is an issue with infrastructure Sorry, at all. But you should be to have more teaching staff or less students. Less students, I think. Why? It's bec it's become uh, sort of a you know factory of tendencies, which do not exchange literally. So there are so many directions that the risk. I'm not saying this is what's taking place nowadays, but the risk is that I mean, it's like in physics, right? If you pull on all sides. The object doesn't move anymore. If you want to have a direction, or if you think that a school could have a direction, I, I think you need a certain amount of people pulling in the same direction, not not necessarily the same ones, of course not. You know, differentiated options and so on. So the larger you are, the more you are kind of a... The risk is the Stasi, I think. I think the AA was something like that in the 70s, although I have not experienced, but I could imagine that the AA would stand for something within a direction, there were alternative proposals, no doubt mm -hmm. about this, but there was no stasis, right? So mm -hmm. if you want to embrace it all, en français on dit qui, qui, qui mal est pris, qui, qui embrasse trop mal est train. If you want to satisfy everyone, there comes a time where this becomes really... Uh, yeah. But it's a very unpopular answer because yeah. it's kind of undemocratic. Yeah. So Not necessarily undemocratic, I think. There's no, a way... It's, no. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, I, I, don't, I don't agree as well. Because you would be killing the, the, the thing that makes it attractive. So you want to go there because there's a certain idea of an environment, a certain idea of competence that you acquire, an experience that you go through. The, the principle why you know, the ETH gets funding yeah. is because they want to spread this kind of quality and be democratic. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. The I agree with you that students yeah, should yeah. be less. But the, the ETH is a, is a school for the elite. It was all, it was established like that, so it, then it comes to a defining what the elite might be nowadays. But I don't think but that is a discussion to have. Talk about elite. Yeah, exactly. So it's not something to talk. But we, we can talk about. So you said quality, and we can point out something super clear. So you should not finish the study ETH not knowing how to draw. Yeah. So and nowadays it's possible that you finish your second year, and after that you don't have to go through a design studio where you have to draw. So you come to your diploma and you don't know how to draw. We know that for a fact. We have students who come to the diploma who have not studied with us or studied with colleagues or sometimes they have studied with us. And they literally tell you, I don't know how to draw. I've never drawn a section. I have a colleague who has heard last semester a student telling him, I have never drawn a section. Well, that's a true problem. It's so there might be less students and less professors. It doesn't mean that we have more professors and smaller classes. I'm not saying that it should become, you know, sort of a GSD. With, no, not at all. That's not what I mean. But that there is, that there is kind of a, you know, a certain awareness of what is going on. So there, it's difficult. It's very, very sensitive topic. No doubt about this. And we've become more and more tolerant also. Less selective, more tolerant. More corrective. More corrective. More demagogic also, I think. 
when you were a student, did you mainly do project by yourselves or always in groups? Mm, both, uh, yeah. both experiences. I think it's necessary that you engage also with rhetorics so that you're going to need words not just images and notations to convince someone to build something. So, by confronting yourself with a pair, you are kind of building up on rhetorics in order to make an argument, make a point. If you're alone by yourself, you do it once in front of the jury and that's it, but you have not acquired that, you know, that ability to somehow, through the wording, mm -hmm. develop a criticality that would take a question of design. Yeah. It's not about you know, placing beautiful words on the design, it's not about this, it's that how, how the argument will then influence that wording. You know, retroactively the project itself. So therefore the group works has its own defaults and flaws. Uh, people can hide also uh, behind a group work. There's no doubt about this, right? Mm -hmm. There are discrepancies, there are frictions, but that's also part of the design process. I really like this, this, this word by, by, by uh, Nikos Ray, you know, when he was teaching this great filmmaker who said, you know, the two great uh, ambassadors of, American, uh, of America are cinema and jazz. Mostly cinema is a collective art just like architecture as a collective art. When you hear an architect, I do this, it's always an abusive language. It's always a teamwork. Right. It's always a collective art. But what I'm, I'm certain is that it's not about, you know, your own architecture. It's about, if anything, it's about the city itself, uh, humbling, you know, gesture towards the city. The city is the great artifact of humankind, I think, right? It's the largest one. It's a fantastic thing that came out there. It also has, Anna Arendt said, it's the beginning of liberty. There's hardly such thing as freedom and liberty without the city. The city is the beginning of liberty. Because you're anonymous. And because you're anonymous, you're free. I guess this idea of, you know, the architect as the creator, it also it became popular because you see the architect as the author. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of problematic. Very much so. But I have an answer to that. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, again, let's go back to, no, literally, let's go back to metaphysical uh, political philosophy with Thomas Hobbes and Leviathan, right? In the, I don't know, third or fourth chapter, you don't have to read the whole thing, but you have to read the first chapters. You know, he talks about what, what is a mask in Greek, right? Or what is a persona with the Romans and so on. The persona is someone who wears a mask, right? And then the author, literally, is the one who holds, holds the building or has the initiative. That's what an author is. In other words, the author of the architecture is the client. The actor, on the contrary, he's the one who acts in the interest of X or Y. And he's therefore the actor. He's acting on behalf of the author, which is then the client. So let's forget about, you know, I like this materialistic view of the things. We're not authors. You know, as much as it can be conflictual within our own mind or within the whole process, we are actors. So I think designing is becoming an actor, and designing architecture is policy making. That's what it is. And again, through philosophy, you understand why. Because the Greeks tell us that what is a political space? The political space is not the Parthenon, it's not the Agora, it's any potential exchange between at least two people. So by building limits between the people, we're defining what politics is. We're defining the political space. So therefore, designing is policy making. I think that there's no such thing as a linear process, absolutely linear process within architecture. I always wonder, that, by the way, I, I always wonder, even when you win something, or when, which I don't often do, but let's say when you win something, you kind of, you know, <laughs> you, you, you kind of wonder, I mean, did I do everything right? Or you, know, you really have to be careful about that. So what is success, for example, in our society nowadays? It means that you are in phase with the expectations of a majority, then you, so many questions, right? What does it mean to be in phase with? What is a majority? What are the characteristics of that majority? You know, do I want to be part of it? Is my role to resist or to actually do what is expected? These are open questions right? that you need to ask yourself when you design, I think. Like, for example, also the immense confusion there is between design as a wording, I think. Design comes from French dessin, except that it's not the dessin uh, that you draft. It's dessin with an E, so D-E-S-S-E-I-N. And dessin is an intent. So design is an intent. It's not a draft. It's just an intent. 
to design is to have an intent. I think that changes a lot of things. Mm -hmm. To realize that design is just an intent and not just a solid object. You know. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.